like a genius I talked about Little Big Man before we started filming. We could easily reprise that Little Big Man mm -hmm. conversation. This is always the problem with the show. If I see you, I'm going to talk about movies that I saw. And also, like, I actually avoid watching movies because I want to do that for the show. Mm -hmm. But who knows when it's ever going to be on the show. So I, or if I think, it's ever going to be on I the think show. I might watch fewer movies than I used to. I saw the second William Friedkin Tracy Let's Play adaptation film. The first was Bug. The second was Killer, Killer Joe. Joe. Matthew McConaughey did a did a great job, but you know and I know who should have gotten that role. Michael Shannon. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe Michael Shannon would have been too scary. Uh, and I don't know if he would have been sexy enough. Yeah. McConaughey definitely brings the sexiness, and he also he can turn it around and make it insane. So let's talk about Django Unchained. Oh, yeah. We went and saw this on New Year's Day. We're not going to give away any spoilers. There was a, an actor in there that I did not know was in the movie playing a major role. That was a nice surprise. Oh, well, you can edit out who you're talking about. <laughs> oh, you didn't I, know he was no, in it? No, I didn't know. No, I didn't was know he was going to be in it. I knew that. Yeah. He's got a lot of detractors. People say, oh, he just makes like film pastiche. He just takes all these things from different movies that he likes and puts them together. But really, that's, I mean, that's what art is. That's what you do when you make art. He made me want to get on a horse with a little German guy and ride around the mountains in the wintertime and practice my marksmanship while listening to Jim Croce. If I could shoot bullets into a bottle. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. Craig, there is only one way that I can introduce tonight's film. And that is through the words of Joe Strummer. Magnificent Seven! I've never seen Magnificent Seven! And you're gonna see it tonight! Released in 1960, this film has quite a murderer's row of famous actors. Yul Brenner, Steve McQueen, Charles Bronson, James Coburn, Eli Wallach, Robert Vaughn, many of whom were not yet big stars. The film is, of course, based on Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, the rights of which prompted a contentious court battle between Brenner, director John Sturgis, and Anthony Quinn, who was supposed to play the lead role. Ooh. McQueen, Coburn, and Bronson would all meet again in Sturgis's next film, The Great Escape. Which I find to be slightly overrated. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Part of it is that I always have a problem with that Attenborough guy. You hate that guy. Yeah. I just like, whenever he's on the screen, I'm like, whoa, what's he doing there? <laughs> Jurassic Park? Uh, <laughs> anything he pops up in. I don't know how he got a sir. Where did he get that sir from? I don't know. He knocked over Alec Guinness and he's like, ah, it's mine now. <laughs> Your gift tonight is in this box. It is a little picture of Yul Brenner and a gun. That is a Japanese Menko card. It's a game that Japanese youth play. They try to take each other's cards by using flipping and wind. Only in Japan would you have a game, a children's game, based off of wind. So this, hopefully, will start your Menko obsession. I'll play with all the kids on my block. <laughs> hey, kids, want to play some Menko? Well, cattle rustlers... Why don't you hop on that nag and ride on over with us to the old leather couch for some epic western adventure, The Magnificent Seven. Yeah! Woo! Get on the trail. Get on the horse. Yes! <laughs> what was that? Horst <laughs> Buchholz. A small Mexican farming village is being raided by Calvera and his gang of bandits. Carol, my good friend. How are you? Who is coming in out of the mountains every few months to basically take as much food as possible. I love this village. Death! So they send three guys off over the border and into the United States to see if they can find any trained gunfighters. When they get into town, they see Chris and Vin heroically driving a hearse into a cemetery to make certain that an Indian can have a proper Christian burial. Boys, the drinks are on me! Yeah! And that's the story of how Indians came to Boot Hill. <laughs> the villagers see this and decide that Chris is the man to rid their village of the raiders. Everyone wears a gun. Sure. Same as they wear pants. By the way, excuse me for not wearing pants. Chris sets about assembling a gang a magnificent group of gunfighters to help him out. Oh, a gunfighter audition. How nice. <laughs> that's, 
Thank you. Next. What is out you're looking for, men? I'm going to be doing a piece from Candide. Then I'm going to shoot a head off a rooster from 20 yards away. Faster. As fast as you can. Sorry, they're not going to be clapping at us when we actually get to the village, right? Because it's really intimidating me. He picks up Vin, played by Steve McQueen. Rap. Plus two from a broadsword, don't forget. I'm going to take a job in a grocery store. The fella says I'm going to make a crackerjack clerk. Crackerjack. I prefer to eat fiddle-faddle. He bumps into his old friend Harry, who thinks that there might be gold in them thar hills. O'Reilly. There's a fella in back chopping wood for breakfast. He eats wood for breakfast? Wow. <laughs> He'd be perfect for their gang. Well, one of us is a fathead. You can get good odds on which. <laughs> Red, wake up. You're a fathead. Ha 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 ha. kind of does have a fathead. Ha ha ha. There he goes. <laughs> but from the side, it doesn't look that fat. He's got a, it's all under the, his head's hips. His face has hips. When... James Coburn stands arms akimbo. He stands like this. <laughs> they witness Brit have a very impressive knife versus gunfight, and that shows that he's the baddest ass guy in the group. And then there's the kid, Chico, a little punk who just wants to prove himself a man by becoming a gunfighter. Clap your hands, and let's see how fast you are. <sighs> Clap hands. No clapping hands. None of that stuff. He died of clapping memories. Who becomes their seventh member. By giving them food. Nanook must have been through here. <laughs> the way to a man's gun is through his stomach. I just thought of that now. <clears throat> so now that the gang's assembled, they head south of the border to save the town. Chico rings the town bell. I want my opera house! So we have time to get ready. This begins the training montage. They also bond with the village by charming their women folk. I got a good mind to throw you in the water. Old West Side story. Farmers talk of nothing but fertilizer and women. No more shitting bitches. <laughs> <laughs> O'Reilly starts to get an entourage. There's these three little kids who like to follow O'Reilly around. We want to collect your Menko card. Everything's going swimmingly. And then Calvera shows up. He's unprepared for what's facing him. And he and his men get driven out. It's a great victory for the town. But Calvera, he doesn't give up that easy. He's waiting off up in the hills, waiting to strike again. And sweat before a fight. Sailors delight. Every time. Sailors decline. <laughs> Does this shot make my head look weird? <laughs> Why don't you ask Calvera what he has in mind for tonight? Yes, do that. Chico, a known Mexican with a German accent, is sent up to blend in with the other Mexicans. There's still plenty of us here. Bring me a plethora of piñatas. Turns out... They're starving. And they've got no recourse but to take what they need from the village. They're not going anywhere. The seven let their guard down, and Calvera sneaks into the village. Buenas noches. Does he kill everyone? No. I don't want to kill you. I so generous. Practical. He takes their guns and drives them out of town. Adios. He even lets them have their guns back as soon as they're clear of the perimeter. Which, of course, is a brilliant idea, because nothing could possibly go wrong for Calvera. It took me a long, long time to learn my old bow from a hot rock. I was a special needs child. <laughs> Do you think the Magnificent Seven are going to stand for that? Nuh-uh. They go back into town, and they just start shooting everyone in sight. A bunch of people die. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Good job, kids. You just killed Charles Bronson. I have just enough strength to kill all three of you. <laughs> the village is saved. Only the farmers have won. We lost. We always lose. Ah! Ah! <laughs> oh!
That is a very good Horst Buchholz. Horst Buchholz. People used to always do Horst Buchholz. In the early, early 60s, it was Brando, Jerry Lewis, Horst Buchholz. <laughs> we lost. We always lose. This movie has a very complicated relationship with heroism, altruism, and violence. And how? I wasn't expecting that. Normally, yeah. it's going in, save the town, walk out victorious. The, the idea of this altruistic drive to help these people is constantly questioned by everyone. And Yul Brenner, who's the guy behind the operation, the leader of the group, he doesn't seem to know why he's doing it himself. Right. It's not just a good guys versus bad guys western. But you can take it that way. You could, but it goes a lot deeper than that. If God didn't want them sheared, he would not have made them sheep. Let's talk about Calvera, who is a very complicated villain. I thought Eli Wallach, I, I thought that was the performance of the movie. I liked him a lot better in this than I did in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, this seemed to be a, a, a deeper, more sinister character, but also a character with his own altruistic goals. I mean, he says, you know, I'm just trying to take care of my men. And he seems to have this belief that, you know, farmers farm and thieves steal and they both serve their functions. And he didn't really see anything wrong with what he was doing. And, well, and when he... You believed him. A thief who steals from a thief is pardoned for 100 years. All right, what does that leave? Only one thing. I pardon you. When he shows up at town at the beginning of the movie, he's like, hey, how, how's, how's it going? His friends are stealing everything in sight. He's a very genial relationship yeah. with, with his victims. Mm-hmm. You don't really see villains like that. No. Especially not in 1960. Practical. And you know, you kind of feel bad for Calvera at the end, don't you? Yeah. Obviously, he's a strategist. Maybe some friends of yours make more trouble for me. A man who never wants no trouble. And also, there's no point in killing them. I'll just let them go. Because they're not going to come back. Because why would they? i make it easy for you. It's a really a gesture of goodwill from him, and then they come back and slaughter his men. Yeah. The whole notions of good and evil are constantly sort of turned on their side. They're not really turned upside down, but they're just really tilted. If I was Calvera, I would have given them their guns back, but not the bullets. Calvera's death speech. For a place like this, why? It, it's, it makes you kind of sad, because he's like, why, why did you do this? Why? <laughs> a man like you. Why? And he's right. And in the end, the surviving members of the Magnificent Seven, they don't know why either. Maybe the message of this movie is that uh, a, a good deed truly is its own reward, even when it takes everything away from you. <laughs> Doing good should be done because it's good. Well, fun fact about this movie, Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen did not get along on the set. Their relationship was described as disastrous. Really? Yes. Yul Brenner was always concerned about being taller than Steve McQueen. When the shot was being set up, he would pile up a little mound of dirt and stand on top of it. At the end of the movie Gunfight, what did you think? I was... It's a little bloody. Just the fact that the townspeople defended themselves just with whatever they had yeah. on hand. Yeah, that was brutal when you saw people chopping guys off of horses with machetes. And I really did enjoy that final battle. Um, felt like there was a lot of not a lot happening leading up to it. You didn't have that tension. Scenes definitely got, got a little dull. And then uh, I felt like I didn't really know a lot of the main group. When you got seven main characters, there's only so much you can do. You can. Yeah, I, mean, I know you can. Of course you can. Well, they, they can't all be called dopey and sleepy and bashful. <laughs> Though that is a big time saver for you young writers out there. <laughs> Good movie. Definitely has some flaws. A very complicated subtext and uh, makes you think. Yeah. Now, pew pew, seen it, seen it, woo! Seen it is the part of the show where we read your comments and suggestions for movies to feature on the show, and I tell you that I've already seen them. Okay, hold on. I somehow, when you started talking, the top of your head became cut off. This is intolerable. Just keep your head how it was when you were talking. Oh, I see what's wrong. He put a little mound of dirt underneath his chair so he appears taller than me. Seen <laughs> <laughs> okay. it is the part of the show where we use your comments and suggestions wisely and read them. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, man. It makes no sense at all. Yeah. You're right. But I'm done with this. You know what scene it is. Tracy Bray, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. This is a black exploitation film. 
Melvin Van Peebles, filmmaker. Father of Mario Van Peebles. Yes. Uh, X-rated film. I thought it was not quite as shocking as I expected it to be. A lot of nudity, basically. Mario Van Peebles made the movie Badass. Mario plays Melvin. Can you think of any other movies where a son plays his real-life father in the movie? I can think of one. Leave your answer in the comments. <laughs> You're not going to tell us. No, I'll tell you next time. Okay. Connor Remsen. I highly recommend watching The Changeling. If you have already, what did you think of it? Clint Eastwood, The Changeling. It's no yelling at an empty chair, but uh, it's not a bad movie. I want my son back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, good. Uh, the guy playing the... Uh, the Condemned Man. Yeah. Uh, he's brilliant. Oh, my God. I thought for sure he would be getting an Oscar nomination for yeah. that. What made him really creepy? He looked just like Jim Neighbors. Yeah. 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 I wish I could think <clears throat> of that guy's name, but you'll probably see it on the screen right now. Anthony Dutchak. In anticipation of the Hobbit movie, I recommend the 1977 animated Hobbit. I saw it probably once a year when I was growing up. They would show that on TV, and that was such an exciting event. I loved the Rankin Bass Hobbit. Doesn't Frodo kill the dragon in the end? No, that's the Lord of the Rings. This is the Hobbit. This mm. is Rankin Bass. It's not Ralph Bakshi. Oh, I've seen the Bakshi one. A lot of people enjoyed our Decline of Western Civilization episode where we watched a movie about hair metal and they recommended some more rock docs. Oh. Osk Creed. Have you watched Metal, A Headbanger's Journey? Seen it? No. Any music fan should watch this movie. Severe Repugnance writes, I'd recommend the documentary Anvil regarding the very engaging world of the Canadian metal band of the same name. Seen it. Not seen it. If you liked Anvil, the story of Anvil, that's the full name, you should watch Searching for the Sugar Man about uh, the reclusive Detroit folk rocker Rodriguez. Uh, very similar arc. Apple iPod 23... I just feel like I've advertised something yeah, that I didn't yeah. want to. If you guys are fans of the band, I'd love to hear you talk about Shut Up and Play the Hits, which is about LCD Sound System's final concert and the events leading up to it. Very emotional stuff. Seen it. Not seen it. Uh, I thought it was a great doc and a, a great concert. But you know what? I don't like all this last waltz business. Except for the last waltz. Well, have has any band who's done a big farewell concert actually stayed broken up? The band... Got back together. Not entirely, but yes. Guided by voices, they didn't stay broken up. Oh, the Who, they have a farewell concert every two years. Yeah. You don't need to break up. Just stop making records. Do other things. You don't need to say, we have broken up. It just seems like kind of a cash grab type of thing. Yeah. That's seen it, and that's our show. Thanks for joining us. Go check out our website, welcome to the basement show.com. Uh, there's a PayPal button there. You can donate a few simoleons and support the show if you like. Also check out the episode guide and we're going to be having some new features coming up on that real soon. Thanks for stopping by everyone. Have a good week. Try not to maraud any Mexican villages. Bye. Bye. Hilario, stop your shouting. It's time for you to stop all of your shouting. It's time for you to stop all of you shouting. Oh, oh. There's one thing you gotta do to make this village new. <laughs> Better stop, stop shutting down. Now. <laughs> Guaranteed to be edited out. <laughs> <laughs>